Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our final session on reflecting on the Holy Trinity and, and also reflecting on the gift of Pentecost. I'm joined once again by Father Kevin Douglas this evening. And before we get started, I would like to just share with you an announcement that's just come out about an upcoming course that will be offered later on this year in October. So as you can see on your screen, I hope, there is a course on the Gospel of Mark that will be offered in October, October 23rd to the 28th at St. Mary's Cathedral, the Catholic Cathedral on Broughton Street. You can register on Eventbrite, but basically the idea is if you want to know Jesus, you have to read the Gospels. And in order to read the Gospels, we have to do a little bit of study. So we encounter the Lord through the scriptures, and um, there's so much to find there. It can be really helpful to have a guide. And so if you're interested in this course, check out Eventbrite, look on the Archdiocesan website, and join us for a week full of wonderful study with Professor James Edwards. Okay, on to our class for tonight. We're going to start with our usual prayer, and then I'll let Father Kevin do a, a recap of what we've covered so far. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Direct, O Lord, we beseech you all our actions by your holy inspirations, and carry them on by your gracious assistance, that every prayer and work of ours may begin always from you, and by you be happily ended through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So first of all, congratulations, though, for making it all the way through this class, week six of our class on the Trinity, which is no small feat. You've made it all the way to the end. So we're going to build on what we've done so far, and we're going to look today at questions 43, articles five to eight, um, obviously building especially on what we did last week. But Father, can you just give us an overview of what we've covered so far, and especially what we did last week in articles one to four, so that we come into this final session really prepared. Yeah, sure, happily. So um, yeah, the course has covered an awful lot of material in the last five, what, five weeks, six weeks. Uh, we've seen fundamentally that the one God whose existence we can know by natural reason, that is simply the unaided power of human thinking, has an inner life, that is revealed to us by Jesus Christ. And that inner life is Father, Son, and Spirit. That threeness or trinity of Father, Son, and Spirit in the one God can, with, of course, all the necessary caveats, be likened to the human experiences of knowing and loving, wherein these activities go forth or proceed from the individual, but also remain within the individual. From all eternity in God, the processions that can be likened to human knowing and loving give rise to relations of origin that exist in themselves or subsist. Unlike our experience of relations in created reality, which exists in a way that is dependent upon other existing things. The distinction between these subsisting relations are the only distinctions that exist in God. And so the subsisting relations are called persons because in creation, a person as capable of free choice, is uniquely individual. And so we use this word to point out what is unique in the divine nature. So to summarize, one nature, two processions, three persons. The persons go forth or proceed from all eternity in, within God. Now, last week, we got to question 43, which talks about the divine missions. Now, the word procession points to the origin of a going forth. Other words like spiration or generation point to the term of a procession. But in both cases, these words point to something contained within God, within eternity. On the other hand, ascending or a mission points to a going forth from God in eternity 
that reaches its term in time and in creation. Now, God is always at work in and present to his creation, but it is also possible for him to become present in a new and fuller way. The missions then refer to the way in which the spirit and son become present in time, in creation, by being sent by the father. The father, who does not take his origin from anyone, cannot, therefore, be sent by anyone. This new way of becoming present comes about through sanctifying grace. And the best picture we have of what sanctifying grace is like is the experience of being loved. Someone external to us loves us, but in doing so, they or their love received somehow transforms us inside. Now, two important distinctions to make before we start the new material this evening. First, these missions of the Son and Holy Spirit can be either visible or invisible. The visible missions have an external, perceivable manifestation. The invisible missions, so to speak, touch our interiority first. And if you like, you could think of them as changing us from the inside out. So I think the most important part of the articles that we're going to look at today, articles five to eight, are actually articles five and six, but we're going to save those for last. We're going to save the best for last. And so we'll look first at articles seven and eight. Now, we've definitely already touched on this, but in article seven, let's just see. St. Thomas asks whether it belongs to the Holy Spirit to be sent visibly. Well, Father just told us that indeed it, it is. I say we've touched on it because we, we already know that there's a visible mission and an invisible mission. The visible mission of the Son in the incarnation, the man we know as Jesus of Nazareth, fully human, fully divine. Can we also talk then about a visible mission of the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes, just Pentecost, for example. But we don't, we don't speak about the moment of Pentecost or the moment of the baptism of the Lord where the dove descends from heaven and, and anoints the Lord. We don't speak about those visible missions in exactly the same way we do as the Son's visible mission. St. Thomas makes the distinction in this way, and he says this in the reply. He says, the son's outward mission is as the author of holiness, the Holy Spirit's outward mission. And remember, he is the gift of holiness, right? One of his proper names is gift. We went through that. His outward mission is as the sign of the accomplishment of holiness. In other words, because of what the son and the Holy Spirit are sent to do, their visible missions appear differently. So let's just unpack that a little bit. What do we mean by saying that Jesus is the author of holiness? It means that the only reason that any one of us becomes holy, and remember that that's precisely why we're here, right? To become like God and to be united with God forever. The only reason that happens is because of Jesus. Always, everywhere, past, present, and future. The holiness of every single person is because of Jesus. He's the son of God. He's not bound by time and space. He's the source of all grace and his life, death, and resurrection won for us every grace that we need for this life. So he is the author of holiness. And St. Thomas adds, and this is in the reply to objection four, it was right as well then that his outward mission be through a rational nature. Such a nature both has the power to act and the capacity to receive holiness. I like that line because it sums up the purpose of our existence. Every single one of you has the power to act and the capacity to receive holiness. I know it sounds simple and that's because it actually is rather simple. You know, you know what to do. So you know, like the slogan from Nike, just do it. 
So if the son is sent as the author of holiness, why is the Holy Spirit sent as well? He is there as the gift of holiness, remember. So if you are growing in your relationship with God, it's because the Holy Spirit is in you, moving you, prompting you, guiding you every step of the way. And he is sent visibly for us to know who he is and what he does. It's easy to forget the Holy Spirit or to overlook him. Because like I said in a previous class, it's not part of our normal experience to think of breath or wind as a personal being. But these are the ways that the Holy Spirit is spoken about or presented. And so those visible missions, for example, the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove at the baptism or the tongues of fire at Pentecost, those visible missions of the Holy Spirit happen so that we know what is happening. In other words, the, the way the Holy Spirit shows up means something about him and about what is happening. So, so none of those visible missions of the Holy Spirit is accidental. For example, St. Thomas explains that at Christ's baptism, the visible mission of the Holy Spirit took place in the form of a dove, who is a prolific creature, in order to show forth Christ's authorship over the grace given through spiritual rebirth. At the transfiguration, when the Holy Spirit was present as the shining cloud, when Jesus is transfigured on Mount Tabor, the mission of the Holy Spirit in that scene shows up in the form of a bright cloud in order to show the spreading light in Christ's teaching. So the Holy Spirit shows up in a certain way to tell us something. To the apostles, St. Thomas says, the mission of the Holy Spirit took the form of a mighty wind as a sign of their power as ministers of the sacraments. It also took the form of tongues as of fire in evidence of their teaching office. So it's it's showing them, what showing us, what they are given in that moment. So all of these missions are signs that signify the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by grace. What's completely beautiful and important to realize, of course, is that in our own reception of the sacraments of baptism and confirmation, we receive the Holy Spirit, especially in confirmation, as the apostles did. We just don't receive a visible mission. But he definitely comes through the rite of the sacrament. But so even though we don't see the tongues of fire descend upon us, even though we don't hear the rush of the mighty wind, the same reality of grace is going on. We are being given sanctifying grace, the presence of the Holy Spirit, to equip us for our mission and our vocation. So that's Article 7. In Article 8, St. Thomas asks about whether a divine person is sent only by the one from whom he proceeds eternally. So just to cover this briefly, when St. Thomas talks about this, he says, people are divided on this issue. You can take it actually in both ways. He writes, to say that any person is sent is to point out both a person who proceeds from another, okay, so like the son proceeds from the father, and an effect, seen or unseen, which is the grounds for acknowledging the mission of a divine person. Okay, so basically, it depends on the conversation that you're having. We can talk about the Son and the Holy Spirit being sent from the Father, and we've talked about that quite a bit. And we can say that because they proceed from Him. Or we can, so we're talking about, in that case, we're talking about kind of like the far end, right, of the sending, not the near end. We can talk about the, inf- the effect in us of the fact that they have been sent. Right, so that's the near end. And that effect comes to us from the entire Trinity. That's because it's an effect outside the Trinity. And the things that are caused by the Trinity are always caused by the three persons acting as one. So why is this important? It's good in itself to remember that the Trinity cares enough about you to come to you personally. And God never ceases to see you and care for you and desire you to be in union with him. The entire God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
are looking for your heart and your response of worship and love. Okay, so Father, can you lead us now into Article 5? This is the best part. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, there you go. Spoiler alert. Yeah, I feel as if I've been built up. And, uh, if it, no, anyway, it will be an anticlimax. So Article 5 is basically whether the sun is sent invisibly. So does the sun have an invisible mission? And in short, St. Thomas says, yes, of course, the sun is sent to us and touches our hearts inside. But it gets interesting when he starts talking about how the sun is sent. So St. Thomas points out that by grace, the whole Trinity inhabits the soul. This is just a reflection of the words of our Lord in John's Gospel, chapter 14. So you remember our Lord says, those who love me will keep my word. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. So note then that the Son and the Spirit are sent, but the Father, who as we saw last week, is in no way sent by anyone, simply abides with the Son and Spirit. But all three persons are present. Now, because the Son is sent, it follows that the Son has an invisible mission. Aquinas goes on to say, that although it is by the gifts of grace that invisible missions are perceived, and therefore the Holy Spirit, and you remember last week, the Holy Spirit, who is both gift and love, because love is the root of all gifts. We give gifts to the people we love. So the first thing we give them is love. And therefore the Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity, especially associated with the invisible missions. Nonetheless, certain gifts pertain to the intellectual life, our capacity to know. And these gifts are rightly attributed to the Son, who is the Word of God. And Aquinas then quotes Saint Augustine, who says, whenever someone has knowledge, knowledge of the Son, that is the son being sent to him. And now we get to the really interesting bit, I think, because St. Thomas then answers an objection. And this answer throws light on the type of knowing that is associated with the son's invisible mission, his new way of being present to us and in our soul. And the objection, put simply, is that oftentimes, you can, or people can, know lots of stuff about Jesus without being remotely holy, you know, without being, without that knowledge touching them, changing them, making them holy. And therefore, we can't presume that sanctifying grace is present within them because they've not been made holy. And Aquinas says then, therefore, that the knowledge of the Son that he's talking about is, and I quote, an enlightening of the mind that, and this is exactly what the Latin says, that bursts forth in the affection of love. So the knowledge of the sun that is the sun coming to us in an invisible mission is an enlightening of the mind that bursts forth in the affection of love. The sun is not sent to us in a cold clinical knowledge about the facts of the gospel, but the sun himself, and that's important, the sun himself, not just the thought of the sun, is being sent whenever someone has what Aquinas calls an experiential awareness of him. And so we find an example of that in scriptures, possibly the most ex famous example uh, uh, of this experiential awareness. You remember the story of the disciples who encounter the resurrected Lord on the road to Emmaus. And by this point, the Lord has left and they, they're left talking about the Lord. And they say, we're not our hearts burning within us as he spoke to us on the road. So he speaks, there are words 
And the effect is their hearts burn within them. So there's this effective word, this effective knowing. And this combination of words spoken that makes the, the disciples' hearts to burn then bears fruit in action. Because the disciples don't just carry on sitting around in Emmaus reminiscing. We're told, and I quote, that same hour the disciples got up and returned to Jerusalem in order to share their experience, in order to proclaim the gospel. And it is that sort of affective knowing that leads us to Christ and bears fruit in holy deeds that Aquinas has in mind when he talks of an enlightenment of the mind that bursts forth into love. That image of the disciples on the road to Emmaus is such a good example, I think, in this discussion, because what you see there is um, there is the visible mission and the invisible mission at the same time. Um, and you see that there's an effect that's interior, that's different from the exterior manifestation of the risen Christ. So it's just a beautiful example of how the Lord actually has to come to their minds and enlightens their minds, and then their hearts begin to come alive. And then, of course, at the end, as you mentioned, what they do is they move, they go back to Jerusalem, they tell others what has happened, and their love is moving them, it's bursting forth. Um, St. Bernard of Clairvaux says that when the word comes to the soul, it means that he will instruct the soul in wisdom. But remember that I love this. Wisdom has like a certain sweetness to it. It is a knowledge that we relish, that we delight in. And the father sends the son so that we will be drawn to the love of wisdom. And I, and I have to say, you, you've probably picked this up. My favorite part of article five is that description of the mission of the son as the word that breathes forth love. I find it, I find it so helpful because um, we don't grasp all of this, right? We can't hold on to the mystery of the Trinity intellectually and just kind of dominate it. We can't, um, we can't master that knowledge and we're not meant to. What we're meant to do is actually to experiment with the love of God, to act with love on what we know to be true by Listen, faith. Can I, can, I, can I jump in there? Because uh -huh. I mean, you used a very particular phrase there to, 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 to experiment with the love of God. So presumably you don't mean by that that we're to put it in a test tube and hold, hold it over a Bunsen burner. But I notice it's also, it's something that Aquinas himself says. He talks mm -hmm. about this experimentalum notitium, this, this experimentative knowing. Uh, and mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could unpack that a little bit for us. So I would say that um, because it is a type of knowledge that is, that is given for us to, to, to move with, to act with, right? It, it inflames the heart with love. We can really speak about experimenting the truth, experimenting this truth that comes to us. And that, what does the experiment look like? It looks like, what does this, what is this word asking me to do in love? What, how am I meant to love differently? Because this word has come to me. And when I say this word, I mean this new knowledge of the son of God. For some reason, in some way, shape, or form, I see him differently now. And because of that new vision, I am moved to act. And so when I say experiment, I mean exactly that. I can't predict what God is going to do when I say yes to him, when he says, you know, when when this, this um, you could call it a revelation with a, with a small r, I think. It is a new vision of the sun in faith, right? Um, I can't predict what God is going to do when I say yes to that, but um, it is, so that's what makes it an experiment. But if, if I can offer him everything that I have um, and I, everything I've got in order to do what I believe that he's asking me to do, then I think that the experiment is, you know, let's let's see what we can build together. Let's see what this mission is going to be. I don't know. Um, does that help? <laughs> it's okay. Our, okay, so our final topic this evening is on Article 6. And St. Thomas asks whether there is an unseen mission to all who share in grace. 
In other words, you know, all of this talk about the sending of the Son and the Holy Spirit, like it sounds really good, right? And the idea of the Trinity, the Blessed Trinity dwelling within the human soul. Okay, um, that's that sounds amazing, right? But it sounds like something that only happens for really special people like Jesus or the Blessed Virgin Mary or, you know, Padre Pio or St. Faustina or something like that. And I don't want to make it sound flippant because it really isn't flippant. The question is a very important one. Because basically what he's saying is, does all of this apply to us? Is that what St. Thomas is saying? He's he's asking that, like, if this is all true, is it true for me? And the answer is yes. And the entire rest of the Summa is basically the unfolding of this yes. Because he writes, according to Augustine, an unseen mission takes place in order to make creatures holy. Now, every creature who is made holy possesses grace. To every such creature, then, there is an unseen mission. So when I say that the rest of the Summa kind of, you know, depends on this question, why do I say that? Because the purpose of the sending of the Son and the Holy Spirit is to bring us home. And that's the structure of the Summa itself. The structure of the Summa is things come forth from God in order to return to him. So the unseen missions, the invisible missions, come to each one of us in order to make us holy, in order to bring us home. And you might object, but I don't feel holy. (laughs) Well, I don't care. That's not the point. It's not about what you feel. Your relationship with God and the fact that he is at work in you is not based on how you feel about it. It's based on how you act, how you live, what you think, what you say, and what you do. So trust and confidence in God, that is what matters. What St. Thomas is saying, and he's following Augustine here as usual, is that when you receive sanctifying grace, either for the first time, like in the sacrament of baptism, or when you are renewed by grace, like in confession, or confirmation, or receiving specific graces corresponding to growth in your personal relationship with God, things that we can't, you know, qualify or, or categorize. When those, when that happens, when you receive grace for the first time, or when you have a renewal by grace, there is an unseen mission. There is an invisible mission to you of the Son and the Holy Spirit. That means it's happening. The word is in you breathing forth love or bursting forth in love, asking you to experiment and to step out in faith. Now, in the replies to the objection, St. Thomas, you know, teases this out a little bit more because it is so incredible what God is doing here that we kind of need to just digest it. We need a minute to think about it. We need a lifetime to think about it. It's more than just what happens in the sacraments, although that is certainly included in what he's saying here. When the Son and the Holy Spirit are sent, they are sent as the word, the truth, who breathes forth love and love as charity, and the love of God is poured into our hearts afresh. So let's look at an objection that he raises here. He says, this is the second objection. St. Thomas says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Only through grace is there growth in virtue. We do not, however, assign an un, an inner mission for every growth in virtue, since then there would be a continuous mission, even as progress in virtue is continuous. Charity either grows or withers. So there can't be an unseen mission to all in grace. That's crazy. But he says, in fact, the objection is wrong. He replies like this. He says, an invisible mission does take place in connection with growth in virtue or the increase in grace. Thus, Augustine holds that the Son is being sent to someone whenever he knows or perceives the Son according to his capacity to do so. And there's more. He says, there is a special instance of an invisible mission based on an increase in grace when someone advances to a new act or a new stage of grace. For example, the act of delivering himself in the fervor of his charity to martyrdom, or to renunciation of all he possesses, or 
and this I love, to taking up any sort of heroic task. Now, St. Thomas doesn't list the heroic tasks in detail. He just gives us a couple to get us thinking, like martyrdom, you know, uh, entering religious life, becoming a priest. He, so he just kind of, you know, lays that out. But he doesn't do that in order to set a limit. I don't want you to see here, like, these are the only things that mean that you have an invisible mission, because that's exactly what it's not. You may not be called to be a martyr or a priest or a religious, but you are called to heroic sanctity. And he says, the taking up of any sort of heroic task, a new act, a new stage in grace, a new virtue, anything, that happens precisely where you are in the midst of your life right now. And that means the Son and Holy Spirit are in you in a new way. There is a renewal by grace. So let me let me just share with you a quick story. And I love this uh, this uh, writer. I've I've just seen excerpts of hers, but they're very. She writes very beautifully, and the story is about the life and love of a woman named Elizabeth Lesseur. And she lived at the turn of the 20th century, a French laywoman. She was a devout Catholic. She was married to a staunch atheist, a vocal atheist. But despite their differences, they, lo they loved each other very deeply. And shortly after they were married, she became ill with the disease of the liver. And that, that illness of hers marked the rest of their marriage. Now, he was a good man, and he was deeply in love with her, and, and he cared for her in her illness. But he wasn't ever religious. And she, in her turn, obviously deeply loved him, and she sacrificed for him, especially her illnesses. And instead of trying to, like, turn him into the Catholic man that she wanted him to be, she made the decision to, to love him as best as she could, exactly as he was, and to offer up sacrifices for his conversion. His name is Felix. And, and she made a very concrete choice to trust that God would hear her prayers. So after 25 years of marriage, she died. And when she died, he was still a staunch atheist. But she had kept a journal all that time. It included her prayers for her husband, her sacrifices, her love for him. And it also included her pain at how the one person that she loved the most could not share with her her love for God. And her husband found her journal and he read there, uh, not just, you know, dear diary, but she read there her thoughts about him. First of all, how grateful she was for his goodness to her, but also the pain that he caused her as he mocked her religion, and also how much she wanted to be able to share with him this man who was her best friend. She wanted to be able to share with him what was most important to her, her love for God, and she couldn't do that. And that was probably the greatest suffering that she endured. But she never held it against him. She simply went on loving him, and he loved her too. So when he read this, her husband Felix was deeply, deeply moved, and he began to explore Christianity. And he ended up a Catholic priest and a Dominican, actually, and he initiated the promotion of her cause for canonization. So she's been recognized as a servant of God and a woman who, who possessed heroic virtue. Now, besides being such a beautiful example of marriage and, and really true selfless love, Elizabeth shows us that heroic virtue doesn't always mean martyrdom or being a missionary. She was a wife in a very ordinary setting, in a, lo in a very loving, but at, a t at times a very painful marriage. She was a woman who deeply loved God and for his sake loved her husband and trusted intensely that God would do his work in Felix's heart. And that is exactly what God did, but she never saw it. I mean, she saw it in heaven, of course, but she never saw it on earth. And that day in, day out choice to love the way that she did was heroic. 
And the same is true for us. Our day in, day out choices to love can be heroic. But it really does have to be a choice and it really does have to be love. So we're not talking about, you know, just putting up with a situation or, you know, you know, kind of stomaching a person that I can't stand. I mean, when I say it has to be a choice and it has to be love, I mean a conviction that is absolutely rooted in faith, in faith, hope, and love, that God has willed me to be here, to be here, to be right now for a purpose. And he has equipped me for that purpose. And I give my life to him each and every day until my last breath. And that includes giving myself to those to whom he has sent me, those whom he has asked me to love. Now I'm speaking in the language of being sent to love because of course we're talking about the visible missions and the invisible missions. And if you think about your own situation in that way, it might be helpful. You didn't just end up in a marriage, you were sent into it. Now for me, that situation is my sister's. And the people whom I serve, I am sent to them. I am sent by God to love them. For you, that might be your husband or your wife or your family. For Father Kevin, it's the people in his parishes. He is sent by God to love them. And we each have our mission and we each have received the persons of the Trinity sent to us personally, completely, so that we can live out that mission. Now, Over the course of your mission, you will be transformed if you cooperate with grace and the Son and the Holy Spirit will be sent to you again and again and again, and you will be renewed by grace and you will be able to experiment this truth. You will be able to experiment what it means to cooperate with the word that breathes forth love. And you receive a deeper charity that prompts you to move with God, to move with the Holy Spirit, to love and to love and to love. And uh, when you rely on your own strength, of course, you fail. And we all know what that's like. But God is at work. And so we just have to keep looking at him and get up and keep going. Now, St. Thomas says that thing about the increase of virtue or the increase of grace. What does that mean? How can we talk about that? How can we understand what he means there? Because frankly, I don't always feel like I'm growing in virtue and maybe I am and maybe I'm not. But most likely there are periods where we're not increasing in virtue. So how do the sending of the son and the Holy Spirit work in that way? What does he mean by that? So you actually have to go to a different part of the Summa where St. Thomas discusses charity. and, And I think it sheds a little bit of light on this idea of growing in virtue. So this is in the second part of the second part. He says a couple of really great things on this in question 24, article six, which is on charity. So listen to this. He says, he says, the spiritual increase of charity is somewhat like the increase of a body. Now, bodily increase in animals and plants is not a continuous movement. But for a certain space of time, nature works by disposing for the increase without causing any actual increase and afterwards brings into effect that to which it had disposed by giving the animal or plant an actual increase. So, all right, what does that mean? For example, and I think we've all had this experience, when kids or teenagers are going to have a growth spurt. They often plump up a little, right? They get whiter before they get taller. So they plump up before they stretch out. That's what St. Thomas is saying. There is a, uh, there's a disposition for increase that, that is there. And then there's the actual increase. Okay. So then he goes on in like manner, charity does not actually increase through every act of charity, but each act of charity disposes us to an increase of charity insofar as one act of charity makes man more ready to act again according to charity. And this readiness increasing, man breaks out into an act of more fervent love. Now, does that not sound like the word breathing forth love? Man breaks out into an act of more fervent love. Okay, are you you making the connection? And so he breaks out into an act of more fervent love and strives to advance in charity. And then his charity increases. 
actually. So in as far as one act of charity makes man more ready to act again. So really concrete, like all you have to do is think, um, I'm going to get out of bed again in the middle of the night for this child who is ill simply because I love this child. I love God who has given me this child. I love this child for his sake. That is an act of charity, right? Anything like that. I'm going to make dinner for my children who complain about food again and again and again. I'm going to make dinner for them because I love them in God. And every time you do that, you are disposing yourself for an increase in charity. You are disposing yourself to receive the word that breathes forth love. And you break out into an act of more fervent love. So basically what this means is that every act we make is either disposing us to a greater love or pulling us away from greater love. Because charity is the life of God in us. We, we can't increase it directly. Only God can do that because he's the cause of, of grace and growth and virtue. But what we can do with his help always is get ourselves ready, okay? We get ourselves ready for the increase. We dispose ourselves to receive him. Dispose means to make ready. So we make our hearts open. We prepare a place. Remember in article five, the indwelling of the Trinity is described, quoting John 14, 23. If a man loves me, this is Jesus speaking at the last supper, right? If a man loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home in him. Wow, that is just amazing. Think of your everyday actions. Everyday actions like, you know, cleaning the home, making the house ready, vacuuming, fluffing the pillows, you know, putting the kettle on. God makes his home in you. God is already there. But what we want is for his presence in us to go deeper and deeper so that there is never a chance that he would feel unwelcome, never a chance that he would leave us. The only way that God leaves us, of course, is by mortal sin. But venial sins, those ways that we kind of reduce our, our responsiveness to him, those ways that we just slightly prefer something else to him just a little bit gets in the way. Venial sin disposes us to mortal sin, you know, like a frog that gets heat that gets heated up and boiled. He doesn't realize that he's boiled to death until he's already dead. But that's what venial sin does. It's just the water getting hotter and hotter and hotter, slowly but surely until you're dead. We don't want that to happen. Okay. We what we want is to always be focused on God, always ready to do his will in the smallest acts of every day so that we're plumping up before we stretch out. So our charity can always intensify. Our love for God can always be warmer and more real and more deeply rooted in us. Now listen to what St. Thomas says on this. He says, the charity of a wayfarer, that's us. So nowadays we say, everybody's on a journey. We're all on a spiritual journey. We're all kind of making our way along, right? So St. Thomas said that 800 years ago. He just used the word wayfarer or via torres in in Latin. The charity of a wayfarer, in other words, a person on a journey, can increase. For we are called wayfarers by reason of our being on the way to God, who is the last end of our happiness. In this way, we advance as we get close to God who is approached, as Augustine says, not by steps of the body, but by the affections of the soul. And this approach is the result of charity, since it unites my man's mind to God. Consequently, it is essential to the charity of a wayfarer that it can increase. So he is within you already, and yet you can approach him more and more And you do so by the affections of your soul, as Augustine said. And one final thought on this, and and I think this is so important, and it's yet another insight from Augustine. Again, St. Thomas is following Augustine all the way through his treatise on the Trinity. So we may at times feel discouraged in our relationship with God, you know, in our living situation, in our job, in our friendships, in our marriages, 
there are all sorts of ways that we get discouraged and God knows this. And it may at times feel really hard to pray or really hopeless. I may not even want to be in the presence of God. I may not even believe that he cares. And we've all been there, right? So in those times, if I can't pray for more faith, hope, and love, and love is just another word for charity, if I can't pray for that, then I can at least ask for the desire to believe, the desire to hope, and the desire to love. We're not perfect yet. We are wayfarers. We're on a journey. And sometimes the desire for God's grace, the desire for God's help is all we can muster. But in those times, we have to make it as fervent a prayer as possible. And we can't stop. I'll finish with one of my favorite passages from Augustine, and then we'll go on to the Q&A if there's any questions. Augustine, who was so near and dear to the heart of St. Thomas. He writes in one of his sermons, and this is in the Liturgy of the Hours, for those of you who pray the Liturgy of the Hours, it's a beautiful one. It's actually the last Saturday in ordinary time, so the very last day of the liturgical year. This is what we hear from Augustine. Let us sing Alleluia here on earth while we are still anxious and worrying, so that we may one day be able to sing it there in heaven without any worry or care. Oh, what a happy alleluia there. How carefree, how safe from all opposition, where nobody will be an enemy, where no one will ever cease to be a friend. God's praises sung there, sung here, here by the anxious, there by the carefree, here by those who will die, there by those who will live forever, here in hope, there in reality here on our journey, there in our homeland. So now, my brethren, let us sing, not to delight our leisure, but to ease our toil. In the way that travelers are in the habit of singing, sing, but keep on walking. What does it mean, keep on walking? Go onward always, but go onward in goodness. For there are, according to the apostle, some people who go ever onward from bad to worse. If you are going onward, you are walking, but always go onward in goodness, onward in the right faith, onward in good habits and behavior. Sing and walk on. So that's all that we are going to cover today. And that concludes our our course on the Trinity. I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Um, Father, was there anything that you wanted to add, anything that I missed um, in tonight's I know, class? I think it's all very thoroughly covered. Just... <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think it's beautiful to remember that the Son and the Holy Spirit are sent to every single one of us personally, individually, in order to bring us home. So even with St. Augustine's word, sing and keep walking, we're not walking by ourselves. They've been sent to come with us. <laughs> They're with us all the way, which is a beautiful thought. I mean, it's just, we're on the road to Emmaus. That's what's going on. Yeah, yeah, very much so, yeah. Okay. All right, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, so if you could give us your blessing, I will close out the webinar. Oh, wait, Uh, never mind. (laughs) I mean, we'll come back to it. But we just got got one, uh, one question here from Jonathan. Thank you both so much. My heart often burned within me during these sessions. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Jonathan. That was uh, an indigestion. <laughs> I don't think it was. And just we just got another thank you. So thank you all very much for your attention and for and for um, being with us during these six weeks. All right, Father, if you could go ahead and give us a Absolutely. blessing. I notice the blessing. Notice the form of the blessing is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So you know we um we finished where we began with the with the Holy Trinity. So the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Almighty Lord bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night, everyone, and go in peace.